Hey, John. Yeah, so you know how Vince and Sam are coming over this weekend? Yeah. Don't you think it would be pretty sweet if we did a 2v2 Age of Sigmar battle against them? Both of our death armies combined. Yeah, that would be pretty awesome. Yeah, but you know what else would be sweet? What's that? If both of our armies were painted. That does sound pretty awesome, but it's Wednesday. That gives me two days to paint this army. Why didn't you tell me sooner? Yeah, I told you a month ago, but we're shooting this bit now, so it makes it look like you're not terrible at time management. Well, as you all know, my ego is the size of the sun, and I can never back down from a challenge, so let's give this a shot. To reiterate, both John and I will be attempting to paint our death armies in two days. Me, my Legion of Blood, him, his Osiarch Bone Reapers, or as he likes to call them, Boner Boys. He also made a video about it over on his channel, which I'll have linked below in the description. The first step in this process, and probably the most important, is the planning stage. It's difficult to look at an entire army and think about how you're going to tackle the entire thing in stages, especially when your entire army isn't mostly the same, like Space Marines or Necrons or Boner Boys. Okay, sorry, sorry. I promise I won't do it again. Boner Boys. I looked over the models in my army and reduced each one to a set of features that would be painted distinctly. For instance, the chain rasps were ghostly cloth, silver metal, copper metal, and black cloth. By the end, I had keywords, essentially, for every detail of my army. I could then take the keywords and group them together if I thought they could be painted using the same steps. For instance, the black hair of my vampires, the black fur of my blood knight horses, and the black cloth of my chain rasps could be painted the same way with a basic approach. Once I had grouped everything up, I had the lowest common denominator of details that I had to define a paint plan for, so that's what I did. As I defined each step, I brought out the paints for them so by the end I had every material next to me so that when I started to paint, I wouldn't need to get up and search for them, hopefully saving some time. Next up is ordering, meaning what order are you going to tackle each of these details in, and coordinating that across an entire army that has different amounts of color on each character and unit is a little bit tricky. I kind of winged it and I ended up with a hybrid approach that I'll talk about a little bit later. Once you have an ordering figured out, working on test model is the last step that could further help you refine your process and paint plan, but I didn't have that luxury, so I just dove right in. All right, it's 7 a.m. on Wednesday. The boys will arrive sometime noon on Friday. I need some time to make this video and have it out on Friday, and that leaves me some 30 to 36 hours if I don't sleep to paint this army. Now, some of the more keen viewers will note that this 2K point list includes five Blood Knights. And if you've seen my 38 hour painting Warhammer marathon, 32 of those hours were spent painting five Blood Knights. So my odds of finishing this army in a 30 to 40 hours, including that five Blood Knights is slim to none. Despite this inevitable failure, I'm still going to try. I started with the red because this is Legion of Blood and I'm not creative. I used a mixture of Chimera Red and Magenta for a Scarlet Red color. I painted every model's red parts with this color as previously planned. For some models, like the Coven Throne, I didn't base coat with this tone, but instead applied a Scarlet Shadow to the Ghosts. I next applied both a highlight and a shadow to the red. For the highlight, I mixed in white and yellow in my base color, and for my shadow, I used purple ink. This was obviously turning the armor into something that wasn't scarlet, so with some red and magenta ink mixed together, I applied it all over the red armor, and because these inks are transparent, they show the undercoat below them, resulting in a fairly juicy red tone that I was pretty happy with. Next, I did further airbrushing, and this is when that hybrid approach I was talking about earlier comes into play. A lot of the zombie dragon is bone, and I wanted to do a blackened bone look. So I started with a dark gray color with the intention of washing it down later to near black. If I were to base coat this all with the brush, it would take forever. So instead, I airbrushed the areas that I could with this gray, and then when I got near the red parts I'd already done, I stopped and left that for the brushwork later. I did the same thing with the skin of the horses, the carriage of the coven throne, Neferata's mount, etc. I also did the same thing with the cream colored cloth, base coating these details in Rakarth flesh, and then shading them with a sepia ink, and highlighting them with a white ink, all through the airbrush. Then I moved on to the ghosts of the Coven Throne and Mortark, and also the skulls of the Mortark's mount. I started with an overbrush of white, which admittedly looks a little trash, but stay with me. If I had all the time in the world, I'd slowly apply white ink with an airbrush from the front, building up opacity on these ghosts, but that would take forever. So instead, I did this little undercoat stage first, and then applied the white ink through my airbrush. 
This is kind of inspired by the base coding approach of Sergio Caval Rubio, Trent Dennison, Rafael Pica, and probably more, where you apply rough highlights and shadows and then smooth it out with an airbrush. The result is that I get a very, very fast, bright white, and then I can fuss with the transitions with an airbrush, which doesn't need to be as bright. I was actually pretty happy with this idea and will likely attempt it more in the future when speed painting armies. All right, we have hit a milestone, and that is that everything that can be airbrushed has been airbrushed. So now it's time to move on to the brushwork, not with these ones specifically, but this is when things start to really, really slow down. It's Wednesday at about 2.30 p.m. I need to be finished by tomorrow at some point so I can make the video. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's not looking good. <laughs> I wonder how John's doing. I'm behind already. Good. Good. Like I alluded to earlier, painting with a brush is an insane time sink. Despite my efforts with the hybrid airbrushing approach, it still took me forever to finish the base coating of the dark gray, which represented all the black bones, black fabric, black hair, and more. As if this process wasn't problematic enough, I encountered a few more problems. One, these massive models are incredibly bizarre to hold, and often left me playing paintbrush twister trying to reach areas that were in annoying spots. Ah! And, Minor setback, some of the paint that I applied is getting rubbed off with some abrasion from my little fingies. No problem, we'll just apply a varnish to some of these guys and set them to the side and paint these smaller models that are easier to hold. In other news, I changed my shirt, I had a lovely dinner of stir fry, and uh, that's about it. I pressed on into the night, slinging paint as fast and as accurate as I could, but called it quits at 10 p.m. so I can get an early start the next day. Good morning, Vietnam. It is 3.27 a.m. Time to pour out a cold one for the boys. Shout out to adults who drink soda. I don't know if waking up at 3.30 a.m. is gonna solve my problems, but damn you if you said I didn't try. What? All right, where were we? I finished up base coating all the black parts at about 7 a.m. and my time was quickly shrinking away. I wanted to move on to the metallics, so I added some chipping with black paint and a sponge to the various red armor parts. With my previous blood knights, I used actual chipping medium, but that whole process took a very long time and has various drawbacks, so I did this method to save some time. Once I had a decent level of weathering, I could paint all of the silver at once. The chips, the chainmail, and other various bits and bobs. I first started with Stormhost Silver, but quickly realized that the opacity of that paint required too many coats soaking up too much time, and I switched to Lead Belcher and was able to grind out all of the silver before my time was coming to a close. Well, I've run out of time and it's pretty clear that I have not finished. And I don't think I could finish if I was given even 20 more hours of painting time. So it's safe to say this is a pretty massive failure, but I've learned some lessons and I will let narrator Scott share those lessons with you because he tends to be a little bit more succinct than me. <laughs> Thank you, painter Scott. Maybe my brevity can inspire your painting a little and you and I can finally have a fully painted army. The first lesson I learned was about pre-planning. To take a massive model like Neferata and reduce her to 10 details was incredibly empowering. It made me feel like she wasn't that intimidating of a model to paint, which helped my mental state. I knew planning was helpful for efficiency's sake, but I didn't think I'd get that kind of benefit from it. The second lesson I learned was that every single thing you do adds up. Every brush stroke, every additional color, even every time you pick up a model. You could almost lose your mind min-maxing your paint scheme, but at the very least, it's worth a couple hours of your time thinking about. Maybe a certain silver color is what you want, but a different brand that's kind of different allows you to get the base coat in one coat as opposed to two to three. Are you willing to sacrifice your paint scheme vision for the sake of time? We're all going to have different answers, but in a lot of cases, my answer is yes, I am willing. At the end of the day, planning and preparation are king, and I should have done more. If you didn't catch it earlier, this video was a collaboration between John and myself. He also made a video detailing his process and he had a lot more success than me. John's channel is new, but his few videos are an absolute gold mine. He has unique approaches and ideas about miniature painting and if his early success is any indication, the future for him looks very promising. Aside from that, John is my friend, so I get to see all the behind the scenes. He stresses out about every detail of the video because he wants to deliver the best product he can manage to you. 
You're in good hands, so check out the video that's linked in the description and also sub to his channel. We also have a podcast together called Trapped Under Plastic, where we wax poetic about miniatures for hours. If you can handle that level of geekery and you're a fan of the occasional chicken tender segue, then that will also be linked in the description for your ear fondling pleasure. Because it's a podcast, get it? Come on, man. That's going to do it for this one, guys. Thanks for hanging out at the end of the video. It means a lot to me. Let me know if I could have improved anything about my paint scheme and my approach. I'd appreciate hearing that feedback from you. If you like the channel and you want to support it, there are a number of ways that you can do it. Namely, a Patreon campaign with a bunch of fun rewards, picking up my merch, purchasing hobby equipment that I recommend, or buying my model, the Duchess, and the digital course that goes along with it. All things linked in the description below. Subscribe or die! But most importantly, don't forget to hate my name!